Okay, so this is uh, the first of two talks that uh, she was going to give. Um, she was here. This is uh, one about mono craters, that uh, same same area that uh, Susan talked about earlier today, and it's talking about um, well, can you get volcanological information with sparse data? Because for a lot of big erupt for a lot of eruptions, we just don't have very many data points of, as we've seen, and so one could question, oh, is that going to be useful volcanologically? And, and uh, so the point of this talk is that, yeah, you can actually infer a number of things about volcanological behavior uh, with few da data points. So the goal here is to extract as much information as we, uh, as we can about volcanological parameters uh, from tephra layers with uh, sparse data. Talk a little bit about uh, information uh, processing uh, of data from, from volcanic fields, sort of in general, and uh, then uh, then go into the location very briefly. We've already talked about mono craters, and then look at the description of the deposits and what we can see from a few sites and, and inferences that we can make about uh, about the eruptions and the eruptive history from now. Um, it's probably can you see that very much at all back there? Yeah. It's highly detailed, uh, let, so let me walk you through it. <laughs> uh, it's a, it actually is something I was thinking about over the last uh, 10 years or so, just trying to think, well, what if we go into some place and we're trying to figure out the, what went on at this volcano? What is the kind of thing that we do when we, we go there? Uh, what kinds of data do we need? What kind of processing of those data do we do? And then uh, what do we get out of it? So in the right-hand side here uh, in pink is uh, the types of data that we, that, we, um, that we gather at volcanoes. And it's sort of the data that I put in the database for, that I have for uh, Mono Craters and that, that Solent has put her data in. Uh, and then the, the geological proce data processing techniques that we use on those data. Uh, and then the output of that, which in this particular case is just correlating layers uh, from one site to another, but it could be also inferences about volcanological parameters here, down here at the bottom. So in thinking about it, the, the main kinds of data that we gather are lithostratigraphic, um, physical parameters of the deposits, the aerial, uh, area spatial data, uh, and the geochemical data. The, G, the data processing that we usually use uh, in these different data sets is uh, uh, in, in the middle column here again, we define uh, uh, magma chambers or, or magma batches or, or magma bits or something, I don't know what you want to call them, based on the geochemistry. And we look for clusters of some kind in those, in those geochemical data. The area uh, spatial data, we try to get, uh, uh, those would be data related to how thickness or grain size varies over a region. Uh, so we need to do some kind of surface uh, function approximation to, to those kinds of data. Uh, presumably, uh, different kinds of data vary spatially in different ways. For example, glass geochemistry, we think, doesn't vary much uh, with uh, uh, distance, from, distance from the vent or with uh, position. But some other parameters like thickness might vary uh, considerably with, with distance from the vent. So there's different surface functions that we're actually, whether we do it explicitly or not, we're fitting to, to those data. Uh, and then the, the lithostatographic information is, is very uh, closely tied in with those uh, surface function approximations because a lot of the, the surface functions that are complicated have to do with thickness or grain size uh, and things like that. The goal of all of these different pieces of data that we, w that we gather together is to, to correlate the, the layers. So the, the idea is that we come up with uh, classifiers that, that fuse information from these different pieces of data, particularly the lithostratigraphic and the geochemical data, which are very different. And we come up with as ma uh, the maximum likelihood correlation from one spot to another of uh, what we're seeing at, at, uh, at any given volcanic field. This kind of formalism becomes more important as we go to places where you have fewer data points and therefore we need to be more and more careful about what exactly we're doing 
uh, when we're correlating from one place to another. So whether we think of it explicitly or not, I think this is sort of what we, we tend to do uh, anywhere. So in the case of the Mono Craters, we're going to apply this to a, a few data points in a pretty much informal way in this talk and, 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 and try to infer as much as we can, not about layer correlation in this particular case, but about uh, volcanic uh, eruption uh, behavior. Uh, position of Mona Lake again. Okay, we won't go through that very fast. We'll go through it very fast. Uh, these are the sites that uh, I'm going to be talking about. There's uh, not a whole lot of sites where you can access uh, what are called the Wilson Creek Formation. Uh, what is called the Wilson Creek Formation that, that uh, Susan talked about earlier. So I'm going to talk about, about layers from the Wilson Creek Formation. For younger uh, layers, for Holocene layers, especially latest Holocene layers, this would almost be covered solid with, with points, uh, with data points that we could have. And in the case of some of the younger eruptions, we have something like 100 or 200 data points for thickness measurements and other lithostratigraphic measurements. So this is really covered with, with data points. But for Wilson Creek formation time, from about 12,000 years ago to about 60,000 years ago, depending on who you are, I guess, right now, it's always in flux how old the, these layers are. Uh, but 12 to 60,000 year old Wilson Creek formation layers, there's not a whole lot of places where you can observe these. So uh, they're basically uh, uh, this area close to the Mono Craters right here, a uh, little bit further away at Horse Meadow Creek, up at the Type section and Mill Creek section, on the south or southern southeastern bluffs, and then out at a place uh, bought north of Warm Spring. So five or six spots where we can collect reasonable data. And here's these, uh, another picture of these layers. Uh, the lowest layers down, there's about 18 rhyolitic tephra layers in here and uh, four basaltic uh, tephra layers in this alternating uh, tephra and silt sequence. Um, most of them are fall deposits. There's a, occasionally uh, a presence of something that's, that's got to be something else. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in, the, in this in this discussion. I'm going to focus on, on, oh sorry, I'm going to focus on the A sequence, that's these layers at the very top of the, top of the outcrop here. Uh, in other places they're not truncated as they are in this, in this photo. Uh, they're exposed quite nicely. Uh, so I'm going to concentrate on these A layers, A1 to A4. And uh, here they are. Uh, this is at, uh, Site. This is at uh, this is at one. <laughs> this is at one of the sites. Uh, A two. <laughs> that is it on the joke. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looks like it's at the type section to me, but I'm not really sure about that. Uh, A two near the type section. This is the basaltic layer that came from Black Point volcano. That probably is meters and meters thick here. But in in uh, in this compressed version, I've cut out the uh, Selena's cut out the the middle of that. She's also taken out the silt layer, so it's just exposing what the different, um, different tephra layers look like. You can see they got pretty uh, complex um, bedding. Uh, the, the intralayer bedding is very important, as well as the interlayer bedding. And, and because of this interlayer bedding, it's pretty easy to tell these packets one from another at different sites. Uh, however, when you look at the, the intralayer properties of, of these different layers, they do vary from one site to another. So A1 and A3 and A4, particularly, those are the rhyolitic ones in this section, look quite different from one site to another. Uh, so one, uh, one problem of, uh, uh, of this is that you do get this problem of these missing, missing beds inside of the, in the interlayer uh, formation within the A4, within the A3. You don't always see the same thing. So what she's done is uh, broken down the, the sequence. This is the, the same site. Again, I think it's the type section. It might be Mill Creek, though. Sorry about that. Sorry for not remembering. Um, but what we typically do uh, is look in very great detail at all the different uh, lithostratigraphic properties of the deposit. This is based on uh, sieving. We get a mean grain size variation. Uh, these are the componentry analyses, percent pumice 
percent lithics, percent aggregates, uh, 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 and then also uh, break it down into percent glass, a lot of obsidian that comes out of this uh, volcanic system, percent uh, pumice in the uh, max class. These are actually the maximum grain sizes, not the percentage here. Okay, so this is actually the, the typical suite of uh, lithostratigraphic parameters that we look at uh, in a deposit. When we're looking at it as volcanologists, these are the, the kinds of things that we typically look at, as well as the thickness of each individual bed uh, within the deposit. Uh, one thing that uh, we haven't talked much about here yet is these maximum class measurements. Uh, and this is uh, thought by, by us volcanologists to be a pretty, ac pretty important measurement to make uh, when we're out of deposit. The, the idea is you take the, the five largest class in the deposit that you can find either in a given length of time or in a given area, and you average the, the three main axes of those five largest class to get an idea of the largest class that came out of the volcano and was thrown to that site. Uh, what, that what that information yields, we believe, is some estimation of the, the size of the eruption column, the, uh, the amount of magma coming out at one time, because that's the largest class that can, can be thrown by the, uh, the uh, rising eruption column. So to us, that's actually quite an important piece of information, that maximum class size. Huh? Pum we do both actually because they have different densities, so they might act differently uh, uh, aerodynamically. And in fact, if they are radically out of phase aerodynamically, that means something something else is going on. Yeah. Okay, so we uh, look at the componentry. So this is a, a, a graph that shows the componentry. Again, that's the different types of grains that we got as a function of grain size. So on the x-axis here is grain size and then percent in the different grain size fractions. Uh, from quite coarse down to uh, very fine. This was done, the, the finest grain size fractions were done by uh, SE, image analysis of SEM images uh, and then translated into three-dimensional objects. Uh, most of the deposit is dominated by, most of the deposits are dominated by some combination of pumice and uh, obsidian, actually not not uh, uh, not uh, accessory or accidental lithics. It's actually obsidian uh, juvenile obsidian pieces. The percentage of juvenile obsidian pieces can vary up to om uh, almost half of the deposit sometimes in some of these. Uh, the other thing that really shows up on uh, in the A sequence here is uh, is aggregates, and the aggregates <coughs> are shown by the colored bars in A or A one. In layer A1B, so this, this layer has a lot of aggregates in it. And the other little bean, bean symbol there on the side of A1B is an ostracod. So it's very similar, I think, to, uh, to uh, Alexa's uh, deposit that she was discussing the other day, the Orunui uh, deposit in New Zealand, uh, with a large number of aggregate, uh, aggregates in it, accretionary uh, uh, lapilli as well as some organisms that were uh, included in the eruption as it came through uh, Lake Bed Sediments. So anytime we see this kind of signature in these deposits, we can uh, actually be pretty assured that the eruption was actually coming up through the lake water. So it was below lake level at that time, and the materials are erupted through, uh, through the lake. Uh, so that's a very good indicator of, of lake uh, lake level and of uh, phreatomagmatic interaction. Um, Susan Ong already discussed uh, the importance of the geochemical uh, correlation from one site to another. So we not only have the lithostratigraphic parameters that we can correlate from one site to another in a systematic fashion, but also these geochemical parameters. This is again the iron type, coexisting iron type, titanium oxides. Uh, it's uh, just, uh, just we just finished this up this year. Came out this year, and it's finally showing that you can uh, distinguish the different um, sequences in the Wilson Creek Formation using the iron titanium oxides, even though the glass compositions are are very uh, homogeneous. Okay, so we can get a, a pretty good correlation from one site to another, even down to uh, the 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 uh, bed level within 
uh, within the uh, historically discussed numbered beds here. So you have the numbered beds, one to, tw uh, one to 20 basically. Now we're correlating on the sub-bed level, if you want, or the, the unit level, and getting a correlation uh, so that we can figure out um, thickness of individual eruptive deposits and magnitude of individual eruptions that go into uh, forming the Wilson Creek Formation. So in the past, what's been done is just this, uh, this whole bed was correlated from one site to another. Now what uh, Selena is doing is correlating these individual beds that make up the bed set uh, from one site to another uh, and getting individual eruption sizes from that eventually. Okay, but it's a bit difficult when you have uh, sparse data. So uh, what can you do, however? Uh, this shows uh, thickness variation among these uh, five, five sites. Uh, where the A1 and A2 layers uh, exist and the A3 and A4 layers. If we take a look at these A3 and A4 layers, uh, there is a general pattern of thinning away from the vent, so this is thicker, closer to the monocraters. Again, the monocraters themselves are down here. So the darker blues are down towards the monocraters. That's as we, we would hope we would find. And what we found is, in fact, uh, you can fit surfaces to these few points and begin to make rough estimates of deposit volumes with pretty large error bars. It can be done, but you've got to acknowledge because you have few data points that you have very large error bars in the uh, volume estimates that you get from this. The data can be fit well to uh, exponentially decreasing model of uh, deposit thickness with distance from the vent, and that's what's shown on, on these things. So we can begin to get an idea of how, how large each eruption pulse was, both in terms of volume of material ejected, as well as in terms of uh, magnitude of the eruption uh, in uh, kilograms per, per second of material coming out of the vent. By looking at the other uh, lithostratigraphic characteristics, particularly the componentry, uh, but also the bedding characteristics, we can get an idea of other parameters that relate to those eruptions at that time. Uh, one of these main things, of course, is the free at degree of phreatomagmatic interaction. So the greatest degree of phreatomagmatic interaction here is shown by those beds in which you have the ostracos and the accretionary lapilli. Uh, another high degree of phreatomagmatic interaction, probably less than that amount of phreatomagmatic interaction, though, is shown by beds where you have a very large percentage of pure obsidian coming out relative to pumice. So in those cases, the material was able to fragment somehow uh, despite the fact that the magmatic gases weren't expanding and breaking apart the material. This, this we believe, indicates an, an interaction of the rising magma with groundwater, not with the surface water of the lake, but with groundwater in the uh, water-soaked sediments underneath uh, the Mono Basin, the entire Mono Basin. Okay, and then the speedometer symbols here indicate that there's a, an indicator of, of changing eruption rate uh, during that, uh, that eruptive pulse. So the speedometer here related to the A1 eruption, that's related to the, the changes in grain size that you see through the A1 eruption. The, as the grain size changes throughout the eruption deposit, the separate beds within the A1 eruption deposit, you get larger, uh, higher, higher eruption columns or lower eruption columns, and larger or lower uh, mass eruption rates. Okay, and then the, the, so we can begin to understand the different types of eruptions that come out of the Mono craters and get rough estimates of their volume despite the fact that we have only uh, five or six uh, unique sites at which we can look at these deposits. Another thing that's actually very pretty easy to do without a whole lot of uh, data sites, of course, is date the deposits. So that doesn't take a whole lot of, of sites. And the problem in Mono Basin, is, as Sue outlined much better than I'm going to do here, is that there's a lot of different date, dating that's been done in Mono Basin, and it's really up in the air uh, how old some of these deposits are. Susan is shaking her head. 
Andre's shaking his head in the other direction, probably. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll cry for it. <laughs> so, um, but depending on, so this this time scale out to out, out to the the top there, that could either go up that high or could go up about that high, depending on who you are right now. Um, what we can do though with that kind of thing, you notice that there are. We, there's enough dates that have been made on these tefillers that you can actually begin to see steps in the tefillers. It's not clear whether these should be flatter than they are, these steps should be flatter than they are, or whether these slopes are real. But there are sets, and those do correspond in the Pleistocene layers here to the, the sets uh, in the Wilson Creek formation. Uh, but we see that step behavior in the Holocene as well. So that there's numerous eruptions. Uh, near in time, and then there's gaps in time, and then numerous eruptions again. So the inter-eruption period changes quite dramatically sometimes, from, from on the order of 100 or 200 years at times, all the way up to 5,000 years or so uh, at other times. So it's very episodic. Okay, so it's useful to have any data for us volcanologically about, uh, about an eruption. Anything will work. Uh, so despite sparse data, it is possible to find out a lot of different things about eruption history. Uh, we got to use a lot of correlation tools, the, visit, the lithostratigraphic parameters, as well as the geochem geochemical parameters to be able to correlate beds from one site to another. Um, the, most of the beds that we've looked at are from the Mono Craters, although as Susan said, some are starting to show up from uh, another volcano about 30 kilometers uh, to the south. The eruptions typically occur in cl clusters with multiple pulses within clusters and within single eruptions within those, within those clusters. Uh, Phreatomagmaticism and vent widening are common at times. Uh, throwing out the, 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 uh, the ostracods or the uh, large amounts of obsidian that are super common at this volcano. And the return period for eruptions uh, varies from about 200 to about 5,000 years. Thank you. So, so John. Um, have you been wondering about the microcris content of those obsidians? <laughs> no comment. No comment. <laughs> okay. Marcus, can, am I on? Uh, you, you seem to use the obsidian as an indicator of free out of, free out of magmatic activity. How do you know that it's not just blowing up a, a previously existing plug? Like at, at uh, yeah. Wilson uh, Dome, or not Wilson Dome, but the uh, uh, Panem. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. That's a that's a that's a really good question. I think, my, and I could be wrong about this, but my uh, my thinking is that you can actually tell those apart. The ones that are older dome fragments, uh, you can generally tell that they look a little bit weathered, and and you can see some kind of surface features on them from being exposed at the, at the surface for a while. I could be totally wrong about that in some ways though. So this is based on my uh, uh, assumption that pretty clear obsidian is actually from uh, deeper and, and not related to uh, dome breaking up. So yeah, that's an assumption. So you're saying it's juvenile? I think it is juvenile though because it is quite clear and not weathered and things like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, the other question I have is that you, you have several control points for, for the, the youngest Mona eruptions. And if, if uh, on the North Shore, have you, have you and others checked to make sure that you don't have uh, a, a, a possible uh, lobe going off to the north? In other words, that you're underestimating the, the uh, Isopacks, or oh. is there absence of data on the North Shore? Is basically what I'm trying to. Yeah, add to. yeah, yeah. There is a, a pretty much a paucity of data on the North Shore there. So you, um, what I didn't, I went over that pretty fast. What I didn't say is those, those, uh, yeah, those. Yeah, so, 
either one of those. Those are actually just helping to define a surface that's actually, we extend that thin, okay? W you, because we do know in general, as you know, that there's a general exponential thinning of fall deposits with uh, square root of area of the isopack that's enclosing them. So if you extrapolate those out, then that's the volumes that we're talking about. Yeah, not just within those. those but you could conceivably have a point to the north where all of these isopacks are extending to the north, right? That's right. And then, then what we would get is that this should actually be have the darker area extending a lot yeah. further like that. Yeah. So that's why there's a huge error bar when you do it this way. <laughs> uh, just staying with the theme of the last question, uh, how do you uh, how do you choose where to end if you're going to extrapolate? How do you choose to do that? I mean, I'm sure there's a bit of arbitrary choosing, but how do you do that with such sparse data? Oh, okay. So if it's exponential thinning, you can integrate under an exponential curve out to infinity, and you'll get a finite volume. It's not an infinite volume. So what that's what you do. What about on the side? So right here, I mean, you could have it just go that direction. You could have it be right nearly and symmetric. And again, that's why there's a big error bar on these because this dark area could end up going this way right. or this way. Well, probably not that way, but you know, probably one of these directions. We don't know about that. That's why it's it's an estimate with a huge error bar on it. But it's an estimate. Yeah, it's better than that. Have you used any Tefra dispersion models to try to fit your six points or five points to it? No, I, yeah, I haven't done it that way. It's just the thickness square root of area thinning thing. The, it's kind of overkill, I would think, with six data points to use a dispersal model, but it could possibly yield something good too. I think it's ridiculously cool that you're erupting crustaceans. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's really amazing. Um, and first of all, so what's the condition of these little shrimp? Uh, what's the condition? Well, it's just their tests. So it's their fossilized tests, that's all. And are they, are they well preserved? Are they looking good? Oh, well, yeah. They can be. Sometimes you get, of course, you get fragments of the shells too. A lot of the time. Um, and do the dry phases of the the more dry phases, do they lack ostracods? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there are uh, plenty of those events where there's no ostracods in the beds whatsoever. So. Mm. so there's a new technique for getting temperatures of calcareous microfossils. This is oh. a newly developed technique at Imperial that could be very interesting to use oh, on something to, like to that. To get the temperature that they were heated up to. Oh, cool, okay. Yeah, Thank and this is, this is kind of a new thing that, you know, give you the name of this guy, that would be really interesting. Yeah, that could be very cool. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just quickly, Marcus, you don't have um, Warm Springs or South Shore data points on those maps, do they not? You didn't find Nash 3 and Nash 4 there? Wait, what? South, uh, uh, sorry, South Shore is not oh. on the map. Sorry. Okay, my inadequacy as a geologist. Yeah, I couldn't find it over there, so. Yeah. She's asking if I couldn't find it over here. No. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Maybe I didn't look it up or in the right places, but using the Bible of LaJoy, I couldn't find it over. Thank <laughs> you.